Uh, welcome. We are looking forward to a really interesting webinar this morning. I'm going to just tell you a little bit about our organization and uh, invite you to get involved. Again, I'm Joanne Gear. I'm the, the Executive Director of the Biopharma Research Council. We're a nonprofit association to bring together researchers from across all the many silos of biomedical research. So we include industry, academia, nonprofit, government, and suppliers, and those who love them. We also take a look at the industry and research that's emerging through a, a lens of disease, a lens of technology, a lens of broad themes, uh, all designed to uh, invite researchers who may not otherwise find each other. I'm just going to share a little bit about our activities this year. We're doing a great program on cybersecurity for connected devices in July in Princeton. And this is about everything from implants like pacemakers to uh, wearables like Fitbits and uh, clothing that has uh, sensors in it and so on. In August, we do a virtual conference on the point of care diagnostics. That's really moving along beautifully. And in October, we go to Kane University in New Jersey, uh, at their Institute for Life Science Entrepreneurship, and uh, do a program, an update on the microbiome. In, also in October, we go to Durham, North Carolina for the fifth time for our Triangle Biotech Research Symposium. Mm -hmm. And the theme this year is D3D, Data Drugs Diagnostics, which is an ongoing theme you'll see from us. Uh, then in November, a physical event in New Jersey again on companion diagnostics. And in November, uh, RPM, the regional pharma manufacturing expo. And this is kind of a new thing for us and we're very excited about anyone who's interested in uh, partnering on it. We're looking at process engineering and the interplay between research and manufacturing from really from the preclinical process all the way through. You can enter questions in the box at any time. One question I always get is, is this session recorded? And the answer is yes. And within a few days, we'll have the recording and the slides posted for your pleasure. And we'll send out an email to let you know. I'm going to introduce Rashi Jain, who is moderating today and has put together this wonderful program. Rashi. Um, hello, everyone, and thank you, Joanne. Um, I'm really excited here, since we're talking about CIPA, something I really wanted to learn more about. Um, maybe I'll kick off with a brief introduction to CIPA. CIPA, which stands for Comprehensive In Vitro Pyrrhythmia Essay, it is a new paradigm in assessing cardiac safety in the drug development process. It is aiming at addressing any shortcomings of the pre existing preclinical cardiac safety paradigm and assessing proarrhythmic risk of drug candidates through a three-step validation study on the electrophysiological mechanisms beyond QT and HERC studies. By moving cardiac safety earlier in the drug development process, FDA is aiming to optimize drug discovery and development by not weeding out any strong drug candidates early in the process and also by minimizing chances of carrying false positives to preclinical to pre and clinical trials. Um, I'll now move on and introduce our two wonderful speakers here in the order of their presentation. Uh, Dr. Bermar Fermini has extensive experience in atrial electrophysiology. He started his career at Montreal Heart Institute, then joined Merck in Pennsylvania, and has been working at Pfizer for 16 years now. Currently, he is the head of ion channel discipline at Pfizer and focuses on the development and execution of research strategies that are key to Pfizer's portfolio. He is also dedicated to the development and validation of in vitro models for assessing the proarrhythmic potential of drug-induced QT interval changes. Additionally, he is a member of the board of directors of the Safety Pharmacology Society, co-chair of the CIPA Ion Channel Working Group, and an active member of the CIPA Steering Committee. Now moving on to Dr. Jim Kramer. Dr. Jim Kramer's expertise lies in ion channel electrophysiology. 
He started off with a postdoctoral fellowship at Case Western University with a focus on potassium ion channel KV2.1. In 1999, he joined Chentest, which is now a Charles River company. Here, he developed cardiac ion channel safety essays and directed several studies and is now a principal scientist at Charles River. Just like Bernard, Jim has been heavily involved in the SIPA initiative. He's not only a member of the Ion Channel Working Group and the Compound Selection Committee, but he's also a co-leader of the High Throughput Screening Validation Team. Without further ado, I will now invite Dr. Bermar Fermini, who will start off with an overview of the SIPA initiative followed by its current status and any challenges that are being faced by the industry. Rashi, thank you very much. And I would also like to thank uh, Joanne, as well as the Biopharma Research Council for um, gently uh, extending the invitation for today's presentation. So um, I would like to talk to you about uh, SIPA. Um, I don't know, you know, given the audience, I think the audience is, is quite uh, varied. Um, I'm going to give you an overview of the SIPA effort. Um, for those who are more familiar with the SIPA effort, I will uh, provide a little bit of new information. Hopefully you'll find that uh, useful. And uh, we can have a, a nice discussion after Jim's presentation about the whole um, SIPA effort. Uh, but before we do, I just want to go through a short disclo uh, dis disclosure and disclaimer. Uh, so I am working for Pfizer. I am a member of the SIPA steering committee as well as co-chairing the um, Iron Channel Working Group with my colleague uh, Nadja Abigarich from Anabias. And the views expressed here are of course my own and they don't necessarily reflect those of Pfizer uh, or uh, the group that I'm part of, Safety Pharmacology, uh, the SIPA Iron Channel Working Group or the steering committee. So um, let me move to the next slide. So SIPA, the whole idea of SIPA, which stands for Comprehensive In Vitro Proarrhythmia Assay Paradigm, uh, was really born in July 2013. Uh, there was a um, meeting at the FDA, and the first idea of SIPA was ruled out back then, and it was really viewed as a revolution in cardiotoxicity testing. Now, we all, uh, at least those of us in, involved in cardiac safety assessment in our different companies or within our different roles, uh, are following guidelines, uh, mostly two important guidelines. The ICH E14, which is a clinical document that states that all new molecules uh, have to go through a thorough QT testing in the clinic uh, before they can be put on the market. And the one that's more relevant to us, at least for, from a preclinical testing perspective, is the S7B document, which really focuses on testing um, one particular channel, the HERP channel, or human ether agogo related gene channel, or the, the endogenous current, which is IKR. Um, and uh, we've been following these guidelines, which rolled out in 2005, but in fact, the issue around um, QT prolongation, uh, HERG inhibition have been around since the early 2000s. Now, since the rollout of the uh, guidelines in 2005, um, they've been very successful because really no drug um, have, have been uh, removed from the market uh, because of QT issues or torsat the point issues. However, the reality is that that's been done at a fairly high cost. Uh, and that cost has really impacted negatively uh, drug development. Because um, the way that we function right now in the assessment, and again, we're focusing around QT prolongation and toss out the point, the way that we function now is um, a lot of our effort is focused around the single line channel, which is HERG. It really assumes the role of gatekeeper in the screening approach, and we are always looking for compounds that have limited activity on this channel. But because of that, and because this channel is very promiscuous, um, many of the compounds that we develop actually hit HERG. And because they do, and because of the propensity of prolonging the QT and potentially uh, developing towards out the point, many of these compounds are removed from the development process. And it's been evaluated that about 60% of the compounds 
that uh, are being worked on in pharmaceutical companies actually are stopped uh, because of the HERG issue. And so, of course, it's a, it's a very a big concern. Um, it really uh, affects the development of new drugs. And, and in the current environment, whenever a drug moves forward that has HERG liability or HERG activity, it definitely impacts the development and therefore the cost of bringing the medicine um, to the patient, as well as the labeling. And the labeling will also affect availability to the patient. Um, and in reality, there's been, you know, uh, probably a large number of very good compounds that have never really made it to uh, human testing because of the HERG liability. And the reality behind that is that um, many drugs that have QT labeling are, are not necessarily prorhythmic. And even though we try to do a lot of work around engineering uh, away from HERG within the, the chemistry environment and the pharmaceutical companies, what very often happens is that as you move away from uh, your potency on HERG, you also affect the potency for your primary target. And so the whole issue has been um, you know, uh, very important and has come to a, a very important point now. So, so again, to reinforce the idea, the current status, um, the issue around HERG and proarrhythmia is, uh, is that, well, HERG doesn't really address the uh, endpoint of concern, which is the proarrhythmia, and specifically towards out the point for uh, QT prolongation. The whole effort focuses mostly on one repolarizing current, although the game has changed over the past few years within the industry, but, but certainly HERG remains the point of focus. Um, not all QT prolongations are HERG dependent. Block of HERG alone is not always sufficient to predict uh, proarrhythmia risk. And there are some blockers that are known, not many, but uh, quite, you know, a, a, a few good examples that are really potent heart blockers, but they're not necessarily proarrhythmic. In fact, there's one uh, that is antiarrhythmic. Um, and increases in QT, again, you know, gives you an index of the uh, the increased possibility of uh, arrhythmias, but it really doesn't predict very well. So we're in a situation where um, really, you know, the way that we test things um, really allows us to identify compounds that interact with HER, but really doesn't help us identify compounds that are pro with NIC. Now, the link between HER prolongation, uh, HERG inhibition, sorry, QT prolongation and arrhythmias is, of course, is one of ion channels. And, and over the years, over the decades of, of, uh, of work on ion channels and arrhythmias, we've developed a, a pretty good understanding of the ionic factors that confer proarrhythmia risk to drugs. Now, I'm not saying that we know everything, uh, because if we did, we wouldn't be talking about SIPA today. But we have a fairly good understanding of the ion channels that are involved in arrhythmias and the mechanism, mechanisms that initiate and sustain arrhythmias. And um, many of these mechanisms are directly amenable to ion channel and, and therefore ion channel studies. Now, um, ion channel data has, has been used previously to help support in silico models. Uh, however, if you look at the way things were done in the past, the majority of the data were obtained under various uh, experimental conditions, not necessarily well constrained, and just uh, a large variety of you know temperatures and uh, solutions and even tissues and therefore uh, the data is available but somewhat scattered not very consistent and I would also say that uh, most of the work that was done prior to the last five to ten years uh, was done on animal models or uh, animal tissue and not human of origin so so really the SIPA effort is focused on assessing the effects of drugs on ion channels that are present in human. And really the goal is to, to build a, a, an assay uh, system that is robust, that is reliable, that is reproducible, and um, that provides standardized approaches, whether it is from patch clamp work, whether it is from in silico work, or as I'll get into a little bit, um, uh, stem cell work. 
So it's, it's really different from the way that we're doing it because the guidelines that we have been working off uh, are really guidelines and um, they're not dogma and therefore there's been a lot of variation in the way that people have set up and the reality is that the regulatory agencies that receive packages to evaluate are also, also find themselves in a position where they have uh, very different, uh, often incomplete packages, uh, allowing them to make decisions on the, uh, the prorate potential of drugs. And therefore, SIPA uh, aims to also address that. So the real issue or the real focus of the whole effort is prorhythmia, is really um, to reduce the premature termination of drugs that have a good profile. Um, and it's really to help make the drug development process more efficient. So again, uh, if you realize that many of the drugs that are being developed uh, don't move forward because they have herd activity that you can't really get rid of or that um, you have a margin, a safety margin between herd activity and your efficacious concentration that is too small. Most of the time uh, these compounds or the, even these series um, will be stopped simply because going forward with a herd positive compound or a compound that is known to prolong the QT uh, is quite expensive and, and, and risky. And so um, SIPA wants to address this by, by really moving the prorhythmic assessment early in the discovery phase, so not wait until the TQT, which is done late phase two, but really in the discovery phase to try to get a, a hold on whether or not your compound, if it's a herd blocker, whether or not it has uh, increased prorhythmia risk. Um, it will certainly uh, remove uh, regulatory uncertainty early. So again, you're not waiting until the phase two to determine whether or not one, your compound belongs to QT and two, whether or not there's a risk for arrhythmia. And uh, the preclinical data will really uh, guide candidate selection and hopefully, and that is really moving forward very nicely, uh, obviate the need for thorough QT studies. And why that is important is because, like I mentioned, TQT studies are performed in late phase two. They're performed on healthy volunteers uh, and they cost about $2 million each. And therefore, large pharmas like Pfizer that move a lot of compounds in development uh, will certainly see the impact um, if uh, the TQT, if the TQT studies are uh, removed. Now, they would be removed, but that doesn't mean that um, you know ECG recordings would be eliminated. In fact, the goal is to bring the recordings earlier on in phase one, have a more thorough phase one, not necessarily the, the depth of a TQT study, but get some recordings done in phase one so that, again, you do most of the work early on when uh, expenses are, 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 are reduced compared to late clinical development, and you can make well-informed decision. So, uh, and uh, an added benefit that is often forgotten about uh, SIPA, at least the hope is that uh, it will allow to make a better decision on drugs that are already labeled. So, SIPA is really uh, three in vitro components and there is a clinical component that I'm not going to spend much time on, uh, but that is also present and really is to evaluate on, on, on an unanticipated effects. And so I, I'm not going to go in further details and I will focus on the three uh, preclinical components of, of SIPA. So there's a strong component that is um, ion channels and uh, the idea is to study drug effect on multiple uh, human channels instead of focusing on one, which is HERG, uh, but look at multiple ion channels and use this data uh, to uh, validate a, uh, an in silico model, which would then help us make prediction on the pro uh, potential of drugs. And we would have a, we have a third component, which is uh, human stem cells, looking at uh, optical action potentials as well as uh, extracellular signals similar to an ECG to really try to pick up um, you know, activities that would not be identified in looking at individual line channels 
and putting that back in the in silico model. We all understand that uh, by focusing on ion channels only, there will be some conditions that will be missed. Uh, and hopefully the, um, the, the um, IPS stem cell um, approach will help us identify uh, things that could be missed or help understand um, differences between looking at channels only and looking at uh, multicellular cardiac preparation. And so uh, I put this slide up as well because um, you hear about CIPA a lot, but uh, the actual structure of CIPA is not, uh, is not very well understood by a large majority of people. And I want to thank Jim Kramer, the next speaker, actually, for putting this slide together. Um, I've, unfortunately for him, Pfizerized it as opposed to Charles Rivered it. Uh, but Jim, I want to thank you for, for this. I think it's a very good illustration. So uh, the SIP organization has a steering committee that oversees all the different efforts. And uh, as I said, there are three uh, preclinical components to it. If you look to the left of the slide, I'm not sure that you can see my uh, pointer or not. But there's the ion channel group, uh, again, of which I am co-chairing uh, with um, Nadja Abigarch from Anabias. And the, the, the role of this, uh, of this group we'll, we'll go through um, in the next few slides, but is really to provide data to the in silico group. Then there's a component that is also ion channel that is the high throughput validation group. And that group is co-chaired actually by Jim, uh, the next speaker, as well as uh, by Sonia uh, stolzley fakes from NanION. There's the... Um, there's the in silico component that is really, uh, at the moment, uh, under um, uh, basically the FDA is is responsible for the, the modeling portion of it and then there's a myocyte working group um, that is also working with uh, IPS cells so um, let me focus a little bit more on the ion channel working group because I'm part of that group and I know uh, you know the details of it so the group was established in in early uh, I'm sorry in late 2000 uh, 13, early 2014, and the idea was really to uh, assemble a, a group of expert uh, electrophysiologists to really help guide the CIPA, the CIPA project. Um, there was really a, a goal also to be inclusive, uh, and therefore the initial membership was, uh, we had up to 18 people, very large group, but it was composed of uh, representatives from pharma, uh, CROs, um, academia, and um, uh, equipment providers, and and again, it was really to help uh, deliver robust, reliable, and reproducible ion channel pro protocols. Really, to generate data that we could fit into the in silico uh, uh, the in silico model um, to try to predict uh, proarrhythmic uh, activity. Uh, some of the initial um, responsibilities of the group was really to determine which ion channel should be selected. Um, should we do, you know, how many more channels than heard and why? Uh, what properties should be studied? So how do we look at these channels? And what would be the endpoints? Uh, only IC50s, kinetics, um, rate, use, voltage dependent, what? So this group worked very well together and uh, really came and proposed some really good protocols to, the, um, to actually uh, be able to generate the data. And then, of course, the, rea the reality was that these protocols uh, ultimately, uh, well, initially the work was done manually, but then uh, eventually the realization is that it would be rolled out into the industry and that most of the work would be done on, on um, high-throughput screening. And so um, there's now an effort, like I mentioned, that Jim is uh, co-chairing to really test the reliability of these protocols on um, HT systems. So which channels were selected? I'm going to go through this relatively quickly, but, but basically understanding the fundamental role of the different channels and arrhythmias, information that we obtained through the Safety Pharmacology Society through a survey, um, basically querying uh, people in the industry to see what channels they worry about in their, um, in their safety development and which channel do they query, uh, and then the literature, and, and therefore seven channels all key channels uh, were selected. And of course, the, the goal is to generate the data and to see which of the channels are the most important ones. And it's not impossible that some of the channels, as well as some of the protocols, uh, 
will be uh, abandoned as the data suggests that they are not necessarily useful. So from uh, the uh, ion channel perspective, the idea was really to try to get as much data from the uh, channels as possible. So um, some of the recommendations, how did we think about, what were we thinking about when we started this? Really, we wanted to get as much data as possible from the channel, so looking at potency, but, all we, uh, but also looking at uh, how block developed uh, for the different channels. The goal was to have simple protocols that would be easy to run cost-effective, robust, and reproducible um, that would be adapted for the different channels that would also be, uh, could be transferred reasonably, uh, reasonably easily to HT systems. And, but, but overall, um, what was really important about this was to try to come up with uh, protocols that were uh, standardized uh, so that we could roll this out uh, into the public and that people would feel comfortable in using these protocols. And that's, again, that's unlike, you know, S7B. So S7B was a uh, guidance document, but with, without really a lot of meat on the bone, and therefore everybody set up their things differently. This is different. This is, we are uh, testing, uh, pressure testing the protocols, pressure testing the approach before we roll it out, so that when we roll it out, uh, it should work for everybody. So there's a, a series of compounds. There's actually 28 compounds that were selected for the entire SIPA effort. Uh, within the ion channel in silico uh, effort, uh, we brought it down to uh, an initial number of 12, really to uh, train the model and eventually go up to the 28 total compounds to validate the model. And again, I would just like to, to say that well, we know that you know the risk of TORS at the point is uh, correlated with drug independent properties. So there, there are a lot of things that can affect uh, eventually the development of, of, of an arrhythmia. And as one of my colleagues really likes to say, you need the right drug, you need the right patient, and you need the right exposure. Uh, and basically, you know, if you go into a uh, diseased patient population with a heart blocker. Uh, and that somehow the exposure goes way beyond the margin of safety that you've established, uh, there's a high risk that even though you've gone through a SIPA approach, you may still see some arrhythmias. So where do we stand? Where does the uh, Ion Channel Working Group stand? So I can tell you that uh, we initially focused our efforts on HERG uh, because it's, of course, the most important channel. Uh, and we did uh, look at the compounds, the 12 compounds, both at uh, physiologic and room temperature in a manual, using a manual voltage clamp approach, because this would serve, this will serve as the gold standard. Uh, the data is currently being uh, analyzed, reanalyzed, and used by the Insilico group. Um, there's a pilot study that uh, is ongoing where people are, are, are testing the um, the HERC protocols on uh, HT system. This large multi-center, multi-HT platform that uh, Jim is co-chairing will kick off, we're hoping soon, probably by the end of second queue. Um, and it was decided at a uh, steering committee that all remaining non-HERC channel work would be done on the HT work, on the, on the HT platform. And uh, there's a SIPA meeting that is now in the process of uh, getting pulled together to um, to be held in early December. So hopefully, you know, uh, what success will look like when we start rolling out SIPA is that we will evaluate drugs on multiple ion channels. This will prevent the attrition due to HERG liability only. By doing so, we'll standardize uh, not only voltage clamp um, manual protocols, but certainly more importantly, uh, HT um, protocols so that people can use them in their system. Um, we will standardize as well the in silico model that will be available to everybody for, for testing. And this will allow simulation of drug-triggered cardiac uh, arrhythmias and will basically level the playing field so that everybody will have access to the same model to test their results in. And this will really provide a comprehensive assessment of direct proarrhythmia potential. Um, by doing so, we will also establish best practice for t stem cells, and that's, that's, that's a world that's really evolving uh, really rapidly. So um, establishing best practice, I think, will, will do um, 
a lot of good there. And using the stem cells will provide a complete assessment of potential prorhythmic drugs. So the focus will move away from uh, QT prolongation um, and potentially eliminate the TQT studies. And that will allow new safe drugs and drugs with uh, wrong labeling really to reach patients more quickly. And this will be, at least in our eyes, what success looks like. So thank you. Thank you, Jim. Um, I will now invite Dr. Jim Kramer, who will talk about the proof of concept. All right, thank you very much. Uh, can everyone hear me? I hope so, and I hope everyone can see my initial slide here. I just want to say thank you for inviting me to give this talk, and it's been uh, a great pleasure talking about this effort, um, because it's made up of a lot of volunteers, actually. Um, a lot, almost all the work that's been done for SIPA so far has uh, been performed by folks that are not getting paid for it. We are working on this in our spare time because we see the value of this effort and we see the value uh, that can come uh, from this in the end, which will mean more uh, and better uh, therapeutics on the market that aren't, aren't being stopped uh, by uh, a single ion channel assay. Uh, so thanks for letting me talk about this, and I am currently employed. I've been, uh, uh, as Rashid pointed out in the beginning, I was a Chan test employee since the beginning, um, and we specialized in ion channels, and recently we have been acquired by Charles River, and I've been working in this field for oh, a good long time. I've been employed at Chan test for about, I guess, 17 years now. Um, and we have, as, as I just said, we've been working extensively in the ion channel field. And here is a slide that shows uh, a summary of the SIPA effort, the SIPA paradigm. And what I'm going to do is show you some of the work that we've performed here at Charles River. Uh, because, you know, no, we want to know, we want to prove that this approach is valuable and that it works and so we've been working uh, for quite a few years to show that this approach has merit and value and uh, so we've been working with ion channels and I'm going to show you some data for that. We've also been uh, working with different in silico models. Uh, the FDA is currently, the FDA, uh, the modeling group there is working with the O'Hara Rudy model and uh, they are modifying it. Uh, and what we've uh, done here at Charles River is we've worked with the O'Hara Rudy model without modifying it. So I'll show you some data that's come from that. We also work with stem cell derived cardiomyocytes. Uh, and uh, I'll show you um, the results of our work in that area. And uh, we move on to our next slide. So here are a few of our case studies that we performed at CRL. And of course, first is uh, we wanted to start with, uh, I just want to show you what a selective herd blocker looks like. So defetilide is a selective herd blocker. And you can see here in this panel, these are uh, human ECGs. And you can see that defetilide, which is shown here, and I've circled it, uh, prolongs the QT. Prolonging the QT is, uh, is, you know, torsades is a very low uh, probability arrhythmia to detect in, in, in the clinic. Uh, so what we use is we use, we use surrogates to detect uh, whether or not a drug is going to be torsadogenic. And uh, one of the main surrogates, of course, is herd block, and the other one is, is QT prolongation. Uh, and you can see here that uh, defetilide definitely prolongs the QT. So here's placebo up in the top, and here along the x-axis is time, 1, 3, 6, and 12 hours. And you can see over time, uh, defetilide definitely prolongs the QT interval. And if you look at the package insert, it's, it's a, it has a high torsodogenic risk. In this slide, what I'm showing is uh, is really the ion channel profile for defetilide. 
and uh, we tested five of the ion channels uh, that uh, you know, five of the seven that that uh, are proposed uh, for SIPA, and you can see here this is concentration on the x-axis. And these are just, these little squares are just the IC50s, the potency of defedlite for each of the ion channels. Uh, so HERG is IKR, IKS, the ORN rectifier, um, the uh, uh, L-type calcium channel, and uh, the sodium channel, the peak sodium channel current. And you can see here, defedlite has a very potent IC50 that's very near the plasma level. And this is just a plot of uh, free to total Cmax uh, values uh, for defetalide. And so it blocks HERG very potently. And when we test defetalide on our stem cell derived cardiomyocytes, we measure uh, action potentials, which are shown here in this top panel. And we also can measure field potential durations in this uh, multi electrode array. Um, platform that we have. In fact, we've got a number of different platforms to, me to measure um, uh, uh, current uh, voltage changes in, 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 in these myocytes. And you can see uh, defedalide does exactly what you would expect. It prolongs the action potential duration. And in fact, it creates uh, early after depolarizations and arrhythmias in single myocytes, action potentials recorded from single myocytes. And also when we're measuring uh, field potential durations, and, and you have to remember a multi electrode array here, this top panel is a single cell, and this is a syncytium of, of cells that are grown in individual wells. And you can see uh, that the field potential duration, which is kind of a surrogate for the APD and a surrogate for the QT is prolonged. And we also get arrhythmias at very high at higher concentrations. And in the O'Hara Rudy model, which is shown at the bottom, uh, we get increased uh, action potential duration. Um, we get EADs and we also get arrhythmias. So for a selective herd blocker like defedlide, uh, the SIPA summary goes something like this. You can see that it blocks HERG selectively. It prolongs APDs. Uh, in the cardiomyocytes, and we also get early after depolarizations. And I should say that these are believed to be the trigger for uh, torsades. Uh, it prolongs the field potential duration in these multi-electrode arrays, and we also get some triggered events or arrhythmias, and it prolongs the simulated AP uh, action potential. So you can see here that when you follow this SIPA paradigm, it really uh, gives an accurate uh, prediction of high torsadogenic risk. So we'll move on to this drug. This is verapamil. Verapamil is kind of, at least in our lab, we consider it the poster child of SIPA because, uh, well, you'll see. So the package insert claims and says accurately that there's no torsadogenic risk of verapamil, and you can see uh, from the records down here, it does not prolong the QT interval. However, if you move on to the ion channel assays, you can see that verapamil is an incredibly potent blocker of the HERG channel. And you can see the uh, IC50 for HERG falls right in the region of the, uh, the plasma level. Um, but there's something interesting that, that occurs, you know, verapamil is not a selective HERG blocker. It also potently blocks, even more potently than HERG, blocks uh, the L-type calcium channel. And that's shown down here in red, and you can see um, that it's, it's actually um, right in line with the free plasma concentration. Um, so, Verapamil is an interesting drug because it's blocking repolarizing current uh, generated by HERG, and it's blocking depolarizing current, which is um, a, a result of CAV 1.2 conductance. And when you throw it into our cardiomyocyte assays, you see 
that we actually get no uh, action potential prolongation. We actually get a slight shortening of the APD uh, in in the action in the single myocytes. In the multi-electrode array, we don't get any prolongation of the field potential duration. We actually get a small shortening. We get shortening, and the same is shown here in our uh, in silico model. We get uh, no prolongation of the APD. We get some shortening. We get no EADs and no arrhythmias. So if you look at the CIPA summary, we see that we're blocking HERG and CAV, and they're off, the, you know, they are offsetting each other. The repolarizing block is offset by the depolarizing block. Um, it shortens the APDs. It doesn't cause EADs. It doesn't prolong the FPD in the cardiomyocytes. There are no triggered events. And there's no increase in the simulated APD uh, at plasma levels. And you can see that this, again, uh, even though verapamil is a really potent herd blocker, by performing these extra ion channel assays and looking at the results in stem cell-derived cardiomyocytes and looking, at, again, at the, at the uh, O'Hara-Rudy model, the in silico model, you can see that we get an accurate prediction of torsiogenic risk, which is no torsiogenic risk. Okay, so there are some drugs that prolong the QT. You know, it's it's fairly well known that just because you prolong the QT, it doesn't mean that you have a prorhythmic or torsiogenic drug. And what I've shown you so far is two examples: an example of a drug that prolongs the QT and an example of a drug that doesn't do anything. So what about drugs that uh, kind of fall in the middle, that prolong the QT but aren't necessarily, uh, do not necessarily possess a very high torsiogenic risk? And we believe moxifloxacin is a good example of that. Um, you can see here in this slide, it, on the left panel, it, uh, you can see it prolongs the QT in humans. and uh, before I summarize the top, if you look at the right panel, this is the, um, the ion channel profile. So you can see that uh, moxifloxacin blocks HERG, okay, but it also blocks CAV a little less potent, potently than HERG. It's the IC50 has shifted a bit to the right compared to the HERG IC50. And if you look at what's interesting is if you look at the package insert for moxifloxacin, it, it's a torsiogenic risk, but it's a really a torsiogenic risk uh, when it's given concomitantly with other with other drugs. At least that's what the uh, other drugs that, that may potentially uh, prolong the QT as well. So um, so in our in, in in our opinion that moxifloxacin is, is kind of in the middle. It's 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 not a high, it doesn't possess a high torsiogenic risk. And what's interesting is when you look at this drug or the effects of this drug on cardiomyocytes, if you look at the single action potentials that are measured in, in, in a cardiomyocyte, you see prolongation. But what's really interesting, what's really caught our eye here is the fact that we are prolonging. So here's, you know, the black uh, color is the, uh, the vehicle control and uh, the red is the highest concentration of moxifloxacin, which is about 300 micromolar. We are prolonging this action potential by 300%. And it's not exactly what we see here that's so interesting, but the fact that of what we don't see here. And what we don't see is are any early after depolarizations at all in, this, in these experiments. If you look at the myocytes that are grown uh, in a well, in syncytion, in syncytion we, again, we see um, a, a prolongation of the field potential. And we only start seeing these triggered events, these, this variability at, at high doses. And again, we see uh, simulated, uh, in the simulated APDs, um, we see a prolongation. But again, we're not seeing any EADs in, in the in silico model. And so the SIPA summary that, that we get for moxifloxacin is, is kind of in the middle. We see a block of HERG, but we also see a block of the L-type calcium channel. 
Uh, it's shifted a bit to the right. It, its potency is just a little bit less potent for CAV 1.2 than it is for HERG. We see prolongation of the action potential durations, but, but we don't see any of those EADs even at 30 times the plasma concentration in APDs. And uh, we're also seeing uh, prolongation of simulated action potential. So, you know, it, it seems that this SIPA summary matches what is, is, um, is stated in the package insert. It's a torsiogenic risk. But it's uh, torsiogenic risk if it's given concomitantly with other, with other drugs that may prolong the action potential. So, I, okay, so I've given you three examples here, a drug that's a selective HERG blocker, I've given you a drug that, uh, you know, is uh, non-torsiogenic and blocks uh, HERG and CAV 1.2, and, and another one that's kind of in the middle, but what, what, how will SIPA handle these drugs that don't block directly any ion channel currents? And um, so here's an example of that kind of drug. This is Wabane. This is a, so, a well-known sodium potassium pump inhibitor. Uh, and you can see here it has uh, no direct effect on any of the five ion channel currents that, that, that are, were measured. But this is where I think the value of the cardium ionocytes is really shines because here is an experiment uh, done with cardium ionocytes. And this experiment is a little bit different than what I showed you before. Before we were actually looking at changes in membrane potential. In these, in these myocytes. But in this experiment, we're actually looking at twitch. And uh, along the top axis, you can see uh, this is vehicle and then increasing doses of Wabane. And on the left axis, it starts, uh, this is the amount of time um, that the myocytes were in the presence of Wabane. So all the way from four hours all the way up to 16 hours. And uh, this, is, this is a really, great assay because not only can you see acute effects, all those experiments I showed you before were acute effects. They were done probably within 15 minutes, you know, uh, the exposure of the drug to, to those, to the channels or the myocytes were about 15 minutes long. Here we can go hours, hours long in the presence of drug. And what you're seeing here in black, it's, I know it's probably hard to see on your screen, but the black, um, uh, trace is is the baseline, and the red is after four hours, eight hours, twelve hours, or sixteen hours. And what you can see with Wabane is um, development of uh, of arrhythmias, and you can see that um, it's dose dependent. We start seeing these arrhythmias here at the, at five nanomolar, and uh, you can see the red. Uh, recordings are rather chaotic and, and possess a lot of variability. And as you increase the uh, the uh, dosage all the way up to 40 nanomolar, you can see that the, the arrhythmias increase. But there's also, what's really interesting is there's also a time component. So you see arrhythmias here developing at 5 nanomolar at 4 hours, and the severity of those arrhythmias increases as you increase the amount of time. So. You know, it, it's it's one of those. I think what this shows is uh, how ion channels and myocytes can work together. You can't detect everything in an ion channel assay, especially one that's an acute ion channel assay. But in these myocyte assays, you have the ability to detect drugs that don't affect the ion channels directly and also have um, long-term effects. So it's just a few conclusions, or two main conclusions, really. I, I we believe here that the SIPA model is a good predictor of torsiogenic risk. We can easily detect uh, selective herd blockers. We can detect mice compounds, which are multiple ion channel effect uh, compounds. They can be identified. And then we can uh, also uh, identify other compounds like Wabane that don't directly inhibit ion channels. And I just wanted to say that all of this, aside from the single the action potential measurements that were done on single myocytes, that was a manual patch clamp, uh, cr uh, current clamp assay. So that was slow. But all of the other data was performed on higher throughput screening platforms, which is what we uh, will be using for the SIP assay. And, and 
because it's higher throughput, it's lower cost. And um, I believe that, that the higher throughput screening technologies will help make SIPA uh, very cost effective. Um, I'm not working alone on this. Uh, a lot of the work, almost all the work here was done by my colleagues, uh, specifically Carlos Sabatero Paz, Andrew Bruning Wright, and Peter Heyerluck, and um, Buzz Brown, Arthur Brown, is, uh, was the former CEO of Chantessa. Without, uh, without him, we could have never come as far as we have in this project. Uh, these are just two um, recent publications uh, in scientific reports. Uh, much of the data is in these papers. The MICE model is superior to the HERC model in predicting torsade to point. And quantitative profiling of the effects of anoxrin on human cardiac ion channels and its application to cardiac risk. And I just want to say again, thank you very much for letting me talk about this. I, I enjoy talking about it quite a bit. And if anyone has any questions, please feel free to ask. Thanks. Well, thank you, Jim. Um, uh, you should all have on your little dashboard uh, a place where you can enter any questions you might have. And Rashi, I'm going to invite you if you have any questions you would like to ask. Sure. Um, so I do have a question, actually. And um, I think both Bernard and Jim can address this. What I'm really trying to understand here is since most of the SIPA tests are kind of standardized. Um, how does it work out well when you have certain molecules or certain targets that do not exactly behave the way you want them to? Um, is that a challenge being faced currently, or has that, has that been tackled already? Um, any pointers on that? Um. Rashi, I'm not quite sure what you mean by compounds that don't behave the way you expect. Um, certainly, uh, we it, it doesn't matter you know what type of molecule it is, and and for uh, SIPA, we're talking about small molecules here. Uh, they will be run into the um, you know all of the different assays. Now, there will likely be some conditions where uh, you will have some disconnect between the ion channel in silico and silico and the, um, the stem cell work. There, there will likely be some situations like that. So mm -hmm. SIPA doesn't preclude any other additional testing uh, internally to make decisions on compounds. Uh, I think that uh, the, the reality is that unless you are in a situation where you're working with your very best compound and uh, you have very little other alternatives from a chemical point of view, um, you will, uh, internally, within the different companies, we also have a series of other tests that really help us generate data where it's really a weight of evidence that helps us decide, in the case of complicated compounds, uh, how we process forward. So certainly the SIPA effort is, is really you know, focused on the arrhythmia part of it, and assuming that we come into a situation where uh, we have a discrepancy between the different assays we will certainly uh, move the compounds, if it's one of high interest, into other testing assays, uh, which will help us decide on the faith of the compound. OK. That makes sense. Yeah, this, is, this is Jim, actually. So you know that happens quite a bit here. We're, we're a CRO, so we see a lot of different compounds. And um, you know uh, what Bernard said is, is exactly true. Is, exactly true and it works actually uh, very well with this paradigm because there are many different compounds that have gotten as far some as far as the clinic and some as far and some just as far as animal studies where, the, where something interesting has been seen and we've been able to determine the mechanism of action um, by using these SIPA assays these these uh, the ion channel assays or the myocyte assays to help clients understand why uh, what they're seeing is happening Okay. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Bernard. Rashi, we have some questions from the audience. If um, Let's take a couple of those. Uh, sure. First, a comment from one of our participants. As someone who was on the ground when HERG made its way into pharma research, it is really nice to see the progress made on a more thorough assessment of cardiac safety based on multiple ion channels. So cheerleading from the side there. 
Um, here's a question. Is drug-drug interaction still considered in assessing compounds in SIPA? Uh, well, drug-drug interaction, uh, I mean, drug-drug interaction, uh, you know, remains uh, a concern. And um, I, I would say that, uh, you know, we will be testing molecules individually. Um, but uh, it, it becomes a decision of where you want to move. Uh, let's say that you, you, know, you go through the SIPR process and you have a molecule that uh, has a profile like moxifloxacin, for example, or Jim was showing. Uh, then it becomes, you know, a, a big part of the decision becomes a clinical decision as to uh, can you move your molecule into a, a patient population that you know will be under uh, medication for multiple compounds that have, you know, the propensity to either block hurt or, or prolong the QT. So drug-drug interactions, you know, remains a, a very important um, concern in the industry. And in fact, you know, it is drug-drug interactions that have kicked or, or uh, removed compounds from the market. So, um, but there is no plan to test, let's say, a combination of molecules into the SIPA uh, paradigm. Uh, however, I will say that there is no restriction in individual companies for testing multiple compounds uh, together uh, in the SIPA uh, paradigm. Yeah, I just I just want to add that, in fact, here at, at CRL, I've been involved in, I think, in the last six months, at least two studies where drug-drug interaction uh, was a concern. and. Uh, we tested them in, in different ion channel assays to determine uh, in individual effects and then uh, concomitant effects. So you see, what, one of the issues with this is um, it provides you know, important information that helps you make decision. But then the reality, though, is the PK profile of the individual components or the individual drugs, once you put it in man, can give you a completely different profile in the sense that uh, concentrations can peak at different times. Uh, you know, there's um, there's so there, there's the possibility that you know one of the component also has a metabolite, and so there's a real level of complexity once you bring the molecule into man. So it's it's important to do these studies early on, and it gives you kind of an index or an indication of the the, the risk associated, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to translate into the clinic. Um, great. We, we do have another question here, and, but I wanted to check in with you, Rashi. Do you have any more questions you'd like to ask? I'm actually good for now. Great. Thank you. Sure. Um, our question is, and I think this has kind of been addressed, but I'll, just, I'll ask the question, see if you'd like to uh, take it a little further. Uh, do more compounds really make it through SEPA versus only HERG? It's through the development process, I think they mean. Well, the, the, so, so I think, again, you know, Jim has shown that the, the, the possibility does exist. I mean, uh, for example, uh, verapamil, which is on the market, uh, never would have been developed if we looked only at HERD because it's a very potent, nasty HERD block. So that's an example. There are many, many compounds that are in the, are in the market that are actually HERD, are HERD blockers and prolong the QT. So, um, Yes, there there would be you know molecules that are important ones on the market that wouldn't exist, um, and and you know in the future may have a revised label thanks to SIPA. Great. Well, I have a question, and to me, uh, I'm fascinated by the development of collaborations. Uh, clearly, you have many different parties involved. You have many companies involved. You have the FDA involved. Um, I'm interested in your both of your comments, and this will be kind of our final moment today, uh, on how the collaboration got going, how the people got their buy-in, how you got buy-in from your companies to, even if you're volunteering your time, you're obviously bringing your knowledge, and I can see CRLs devoting resources. Um, and uh, how, how does that, how did it get started and, and how has it been maintained and developed? I'm going to ask you first, Bernard. Okay. Um, so it actually got started from, uh, I would say, the, the FDA. So a realization that there were many, many molecules that were uh, stopped in development 
um, because of HERG activity and the realization that many of these molecules for diseases for which there was no real good medication on the market. And so um, something had to be done. And, and uh, this was really a proposal that originally came uh, in large part from uh, the cardiorenal division of the FDA. And uh, the way that it moved forward was we had like the think tank meeting in July 2013. And then some groups got involved. Uh, people got identified to lead the groups. And uh, you know uh, the people that were selected, uh, including myself and Jim, are um, very enthusiastic. You you really have to buy into the idea. Um, and I think that you know the time has come for us to move to the next step. And even though there's a risk that this may not work at all, um, Jim already showed some data that there's you know it seems like it's going to work. But you have to buy into the idea, and you have to be able then to carry it. And I think. You know, we've been doing that uh, successfully. Not to say that it, everything has been smooth and not to say that things are moving as fast as we would like to, but you know, when you start with a team of 18 people, for example, for the Iron Channel Working Group, that's a lot of people to carry around, but at the same time, it's you know, incredible intellect and it's just very stimulating. And, I, and I'll say for myself, I'm you know, still very much excited about this. I, I, I love working with guys like Jim. And I think that most of the people that are leading this are exactly, you know, have exactly the same profile. Thank you, Jim. Would you like to add to that? Yeah, I just like to say it's it's been great working with Bernard and everyone actually uh, that's been trying to push this forward. I, I think um, everyone has been uh, very careful about how we're moving forward in this. I mean, a lot of great care, specifically the Ion Channel Working Group, when we were trying to come up with uh, voltage protocols. I mean, a lot of there was a lot of back and forth, and a lot of uh, uh, opinions. But everyone worked well together. I'd like to say that you know this approach, uh, multiple ion channel effects, is something that you know we've been involved with for you know, decades. <laughs> it's just, it goes way back uh, when we when I first started at Chantest. I mean, that was that's uh, something that we've always recognized as being a very powerful uh, component of of a drug's torsiogenic risk. And um, so it's been so it's been great. And um, I'm hoping that uh, you know, like Bernard said, the progress has been a little bit fits and starts, but I think um, I think it's going forward quite well. Well, terrific. Well, I want to thank everyone, our speakers today. Thank you, Rashi, to put the, putting this program together. Thank you to our audience. And uh, you'll be hearing from us through the link for the recording, and you should feel free to share it with your colleagues when you receive it. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.